Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, June 11, 2014 meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. The first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from May 28. Move to approve. Second. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there were a couple of things that I... Oh, okay. Oh, on page two, down, well, counting up from the bottom, it's the third paragraph it begins with the word Dickinson. But it's not that sentence, it's the next line. Uh, that line begins, responded the city preferred a fee simple dedication. Connection to Orchard is long term comprehensive plan, so this, so as these lots are divided. It seems that. Connection to Orchard is a long-term <coughs> comprehensive plan goal. Might be a better... Or connecting to Orchard. Connecting to, yeah. <laughs> Just add it. The word, uh, word a, a in front of long-term and the word goal after plan seems to be missing. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other Scribner's observations that anyone uh, have? <laughs> okay. I have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the minutes of May 28th, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> and abstention. <coughs> All right. Correspondence. Anything from staff? Nothing from staff. Okay. Uh, I got approached by Nick Sanyong. He's on uh, the University of Idaho faculty. I think in geography. In that, oh, isn't it conservation? I, conservation um, um, so in our national natural resources. Thank you. Yeah. Conservation, <laughs> social, yeah. Science. Yeah. conservation yeah. social science. Thank you. Okay. Nick in, in conservation social science. Um, he was looking for a student project in the form of some sort of surveying was what he outlined to me. We were standing in line at the co-op to pay for our stuff. Um, and he proposed something around the North Main beautification. I don't know that there's a question in there that we really want to think about. So I'm, I'm putting it out to you that I'm going to go have coffee with Nick and, and try to inch towards understanding what this resource is. It's obviously not something till fall. And then with a better understanding Maybe we can frame something, some, some thing we would like to focus on. What about the ADU discussion? Oh. And I thought yes. about ADU. We are in the process of doing a random survey, correct? We would be doing it after the summer, mm -hmm. waiting for people to come back. So that, that would be the, the plan. Um, would be that we conduct one in September or so. Mm -hmm. But if there was a resource available to do door tour and your sub surveys, maybe that would be a good maybe okay. Good so to uh, consider as an alternative to doing our mail yep. survey. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. If we thought we could get a high quality result, would be the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does he have to put all his students through hack certification to do that? I right. I mean, there there will be several uh, things to. To, uh, figure out. The question is whether they have the resources to uh, get a, a broadly based sample. And we presumably the city could provide a list, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think the sample size based upon budgetary constraints we were looking at previously was going to be somewhere between 200 and 400 respondents, and so that should be manageable for a class project. And that's certainly something we can talk with Nick about as far as the size of the class and how much time they'd have to be able to do that, but that just that tends to align with a discussion topic that we were mm -hmm. looking for, that kind of information. Mm -hmm. And are they looking for specific projects like that or more general forward-thinking things? Because the other opportunity would be to survey people on their attitudes mm -hmm. towards the city planning for climate change, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I would worry about with the, the, um, the um, 
accessory dwelling um, timeline is that if you know being on the instructor end I would think that if you're going to start it in August it would be something that would go several months and aren't we trying to move forward with a public hearing by September or am I wrong? We're going to do the survey in September. Oh, oh, okay. The hearing okay, will have to okay. Follow I'm probably off a month or two after that. Right, okay. Right. Uh, I think so the overall goal is by the end of the year being able to forward a recommendation to the city council. So it might mash up really well. Then I, I yeah. was thinking that would be right. the one obstacle. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will go have some coffee. See what we can learn. Could be of economic benefit to the whole thing if they can do the survey and sure. we don't have to. Right. Use right. our budget to do that. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And for two ideas, the ADU and the, so maybe a, a different sort of take on uh, city planning and climate change. Um, the other oh. thing. <laughs> no. Well, they could have half the how class do one. Yeah. yeah. Depending on how big his class right. is. Right. Depending on what the resource looks like. Uh, uh, the larger question and then the more local question. Right. Sounds like. Um, in one of the um, reason statements that we're looking at, there was mention of because we're doing this pursuant to the city area of city impact conversation or mm -hmm. agreement. And my question is, what's the status of the conversation that we're having with the county on that? The conversation is on hold at the moment. At the meeting we had, <clears throat> what did I last fall? One of the the items that the council and the commissioners felt needed to be completed was the city's transportation plan. Um, the ring road concept has been a topic of controversy in <laughs> prior area city impact discussions. The city was on the verge of completing a 50-year transportation plan that would be assessing and modeling the benefits in comparison to the anticipated costs of the ring road concept. We felt it would be appropriate for that process to come to conclusion, for the council to receive that report and those re recommendations regarding that transportation feature or planning policy to determine whether that is going to continue to be the city's long-range transportation policy so that if something was going to be changing, we could accommodate that during the ACI discussion and ultimately the update and adoption of the comp plan. Because one of the things that certainly we'd be seeking out of the ACI negotiations before the county to adopt the city's updated comp plan, of which the, tr the ring road is a, a component. If it was going to change or be altered or be a bypass just on one side rather than um, on all four quadrants of the city, uh, I felt it would be best for us to have that conversation first before getting into the ACI discussion. Um, and so at this point, I'm just waiting for that to get presented to the council. I think the uh, Public Works Department that is managing that project is waiting for the final draft to come back from public comment and review. And I expect that probably by middle of July and then present it to the council maybe in August. I haven't heard the exact time frame. Um, once that's out there, then I think we'll seek guidance from the council about that position and that question. And once we get some direction there, then we'll probably re-engage in the ACI discussion. Okay. So thanks. And there were two modes for that discussion. One is an amicable mode, in which there is no right. clock. And I take it we are in that mode. We are in that mode. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. What's the acronym of ACI? Oh, Area of City Impact. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. 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 yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking City Area of Impact. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next up, Transportation Commission. That's easy. Uh, we've discussed the last meeting that was held, and I just got notification that the uh, meeting tomorrow is canceled. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, you give good short reports. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> well, I'll try to make this about as brief. This is the moment for the open microphone when members of the public may speak to the Commission regarding matters not on the agenda or nor are currently pending before the Planning and Zoning Commission. And tonight there is no one in the audience, so we'll move on to the next I'm item. I'm always amazed by how many people actually tell me that they watch. Oh, really? Them. So mm -hmm. All my students are on summer break. <laughs> <laughs> They're not watching. <laughs> no captive audiences any longer. <laughs> right. 
All right, so we now have item six, which composed of three parts. Approval of three different relevant criteria and standards. So let's take the first one, um, which is the, um, well, that's actually got two parts too, doesn't it? It's the rezone and preliminary <coughs> plat for track D of Robinson's tract subdivision area city impact permit application LPU 2014-00-9 and LPU 2014-00-12. Um, let's take them in uh, order, that is the rezone, and I found at the bottom in the footer was the way I could tell these documents apart. Okay. Um, so. I would entertain a motion or a discussion relative to the rezone um, LPU double up 12. <clears throat> I would move to accept it. Statement of relevant criteria for the rezone of this property as described in the table okay. right here. Okay. Well, I've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of uh, accepting the re the Relevant criteria and standards for the rezone. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. Now, the other one is the preliminary plat. Hmm. The footers have both have 0012 in them, and one of them is probably double o, triple o nine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Any discussion of the preliminary plat reason statement? Looks like it captures the discussion that we had pretty much. Yeah. I would move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Sure. Uh, I want to thank staff for the um, in the relevant criteria statement the plan is not contradictory to the Moscow Comprehensive Plan. The second sentence, with the recommended 30-foot right-of-way dedication for the extension of Pavel Court, the preliminary plan will be consistent with the thoroughfare plan contained in the Comprehensive Plan. We asked for some sort of language like that to underline what we felt was the importance of continuing to build the connectivity. Mm -hmm. So I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor of the preliminary plat reason statement, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. Now we are on to the um, reason statement for which you can find in the middle of the page. It says Dan Mack, Carmichael Road. This, you will recall, is the expansion of the um, RV park. It's interesting to note how the formats of these <coughs> documents differ. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's special use. Yeah. This this is the historical form that we utilized, and um, we just actually actually recently shifted away from it. The board of adjustments. So the board in about 2007, I believe. When it came back over, we shifted to doing the relevant criteria and the reason statements in a different fashion, and we adopted a different form. The uh, Board of Adjustment has been using our historical forms for the variances, condition use permits, and special use permits that they hear. Um, I'm assuming Mike, when he was preparing this, was just utilizing that form uh, in yeah. that fashion. Um, but the Board will be shifting to having relevant criteria documents more similar to what the uh, commission does today. So those will be going away. Okay. 
So I think we have a motion in the second. There's no more discussion. All in favor of approving this? I don't think we, I don't think we did. Sorry. Either one. <laughs> okay. I, I, but I, I would still move to accept the relevant Thank you. <laughs> statement of relevant criteria. Unless you're doing well, Bill. For a special <laughs> use permit. Uh, and this is a recommendation to the county, <coughs> the city council. This is this is a county this, issue that we're the, right. We are recommending yeah. to the question to the um, board of commissioners. So I have a motion. Second. Thank you, Gregor. Now. We're out of the gates. <laughs> All in favor of approving the reason statement say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. One more. This is the rezoning of property on Asbury Street. I would move to approve. Well, it might be a better nod since she came to the commission. I don't yeah, know if that's, that's it's, it's, it's it's okay. You're advancing I'm, the business. Uh, okay. <coughs> I, I move to approve. Okay. I second it. Thank you. Any other observations or comments? Yeah, this is just a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, idea. right. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so does the Moscow Historic Preservation yeah. Commission. So. Okay. All in favor of approving the reason statement say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. I wish they were all that easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I take it I have a bunch of signature work to do here. Um, item number seven, review of mobile food vending ordinance research. Review? Two reviews? Bill? No. Review of a review? <laughs> I think it's going to be more of a discussion this evening, <coughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, as the commission may recall, we started this conversation a few meetings ago. Um, I think uh, Nils brought the topic up, but it's something that we had been discussing internally among the department just in some conflicts that had arisen over time with some of the language in the Central Business District as it relates to um, food establishments and those that are catered to on-premise consumption and those that may be situated more for takeout or delivery type activities, not necessarily a, a drive-through, that is a, that's a distinctly different element in the code, but really kind of the on-premise versus off-premise um, situation. So we began a conversation, just kind of introduced the topic. I think we handed out a copy of the city's existing uh, vendor's ordinance that addresses that kind of activity that may be occurring on a public right-of-way, for example, in this picture in front of Hodgins Drug. Um, and where we will be picking up is kind of how, how does, do we want to try to address this activity on private property and are there some things we want to consider and, and some inconsistencies in the code that maybe should be addressed. So um, we, we talked about it in the context of a fairly minor amendment to eliminate the on-premise consumption, primarily for on-premise consumption, but as we kind of thought through it a little bit more deeply, um, we're not sure that that's really the best path to take. So I just wanted to cover that here. So um, as I mentioned, we've recently been discussing the topic um, of mobile food vending, which is kind of food trucks, or it could be food carts. Um, but most often it's, it's food truck nation, it's the current um, phenomenon and, and increase in that kind of activity that's creating uh, an opportunity for entrepreneurs to begin food service at a lower price point, um, begin to grow, expand, and maybe move into then a bricks and mortar type location over time. Um, we looked at this here uh, again a few meetings ago. We looked at the references that exist within the cities vendor's ordinance which, which regulates vending activities and that includes specifically in the language food wagons and carts um, were located upon public property such as public rights of way. It's also important to note that vending ordinance covers not just food service but the vending of any type of product or merchandise um, and so vending itself obviously extends above and beyond um, just food service itself. We also reviewed the Central Business District and the references to the eating establishments that cater um, to on-premise consumers. 
as being what is now allowed as a use by rights and that a condition use permit is required for food establishments that are primarily for takeout and delivery. Um, one of the things we, we kind of discussed with the city attorney is this, is this term establishment and when does something become an establishment. So, so the initial thoughts were, well, we could just potentially come in and modify the language in the CP district, remove the references to the on-premise consumption. And that has, that has popped up over time, so for example, when Patty's uh, kitchen first started, it was a STAM. Actually, it was one of the first land use applications that processed for the city back in 2002, I think it was, um, with no on-premise seating. And it was pretty much delivery or takeout of that location. The, their site is within the central business district, and therefore it required a conditional use permit in that location. Um, we have had other instances where, um, whether it was Hogs Grill or it was Vlots or I can't recall the name of the uh, sauce, was the last one that was fairly short-lived in the location on the 6th and Jackson corner, mm -hmm. um, where we had something that was in more permanent structure. You know, we requested they provided some form of seating so that, um, you know, they would be consistent with, with being for on-premise on consumption. One, one of the issues in talking through the city, this with the city attorney, is that he did not believe or feel that a, a truck was an establishment, and therefore just modifying the language to remove the restriction or the requirement for the on-premise consumption would not maybe directly address um, those types of activities. Um, so that's how we'll kind of get a little bit farther into the conversation. And at the, at the meeting, it, it appeared to be the commission's desire, and I think it was staff's desire, to ensure that the zone code allows for this type of activity in and around the downtown area and probably in other locations in the community to facilitate economic, uh, social activity and promote that entrepreneurship opportunity within Moscow. Um, and so that's kind of why we're continuing the conversation. As I mentioned, the zoning code itself right now does not make any reference to um, vending as a use, as it may occur on private property. <coughs> um, and it, that can occur in a number of different way or forms. We have firework stands that happen you know, near the 4th of July. We have Christmas tree sales during the Christmas holidays. Um, we have the occasional sunglass sales stand, blankets, um, other types of merchandise. You know, those, those have a um, fairly temporary nature. You know when the fourth, you know, the firework stands are going to go up maybe two weeks before the fourth and they're going to come right down after. Same thing with the, with the Christmas tree stand. Most of the other type of activities that we see, um, whether they're uh, sunglasses or, or uh, textbook buybacks or, or floor blankets, um, oftentimes are there for a duration of a day or two, and they're short duration and, and they leave. Uh, right now in the Motor Business District, technically, all activities are required to, um, all activities are required to be conducted in a fully enclosed building <coughs> with certain exceptions that relate to out seasonal outdoor displays. Um, outdoor seating and dining areas, building supply yards, landscape you know, supply. There are some uses that are specifically named, but technically most of the activities are required to be happening inside a closed building. Um, and so right now the city code really doesn't address those, what we generally would consider to be more temporary uses. They're uses that are going to be there for a limited duration, um, but it is, it is currently silent and we have not you know, really made any you know, effort in the past to uh, regulate those uh, actively. But does silence mean prohib prohibition in this case? There, um, I think the question, the, the, the activity is retail sales. In, in most of those events, whether it's a fireworks stand or a Christmas tree lot, it's a retail sale activity. So retail sales are a permitted use in the district. So those are generally permissible. The question would be whether they're meeting the limitations on the use that they're happening within the enclosed building, which typically that's structured to the establishment of a permanent use in the structure within that zoning district and does not necessarily address these kind of transitory short duration uses. Right. So I'd say the use activity itself is, um, I think you could characterize it as a retail activity. And so the use is a permissible use, whether it meets the development standards in the code, you know, there mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also another nuance. You could imagine that a motor business would have some 
uh, a, a business in the water business district would have an outdoor sale mid-August crazy days kind of sure. thing. It's their own inventory they're putting out front as opposed to it's the some third party who's using their parking lot. So there, there's that split and, and there's the food yeah. vending split. Troy State's traditionally had the tent sale out in the parking lot. You know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, and there used to be more activity in the downtown core when crazy days was, you know, more active in the downtown area. Um, in the downtown area, it's actually addressed in the, in the vendor's ordinance where there's a, that allowance or an exception from the vendor's ordinance for an establishment to put, you know, some seasonal display of products outside in the public right away. Um, as you got to the, the motor business district, you're not really necessarily addressing, you're not dealing with public right away, you're more what's happening on the individual private property. But the focus of the conversation certainly has been upon the vending of prepared food products or, the, or food vending. Um, but then it can also include mm -hmm. other goods and services. And it was, it was just something to, to mention and something that we may wish to consider, whether it's just to formally recognize those activities, just to know that they're there and going to happen. Um, but it's just something to mention that our, our vendor ordinance in the public Broadway does address a wide variety of end uses, and that may be something we want to consider here. Um, and so there, there may be a need to, to determine whether we want to have a distinction between food vending or whether there's vending as a whole. And we can certainly talk about that as we get into a little more um, depth. Um, as I mentioned, we discussed a more modest amendment to the language within the CV and the GV that had the on-premise versus off-premise consumption. Um, you know, our concern was that that may not be adequate to capture the mobile food vending and to fully endorse it that we could point to see here this is where it's allowed because they may not be an actually an establishment if there's no you know, permanent fixture to the ground or structure or permanent place of, of activity and that may not be actually what we want to see happen either you may not want to see the taco van or taco truck that sets up and also ends up with a deck of you know a, an awning attached to it and it becomes more of a permanent structure and never leaves the site um, many communities, as they look at mobile food truck service, require them to be removed from the site daily where they can go back. Some even have to have an approved birthing site where it goes back to be serviced, um, you know, empty, cleaned, restocked, and put back out. But that you don't necessarily want to collect them as permanent fixtures on vacant lots, but that they can come out and go back, you know, on a daily basis. And, and some communities have gone to the extent, these are obviously in, in much larger urbanized areas where they can't be any one location for more than two hours or four hours and require them to move around. And many communities started off with fairly restrictive limits of a two hour, well, when it takes half an hour to set up and a half an hour to close down to move locations, that's really was limiting their, their time period. And, and so there is that aspect of if this is kind of a temporary transitory use, maybe that's something that you want to look at. So. Um, you know, we felt that probably the best that just modifying the language in the CB and GB, while we still think should occur, because we think things like vlogs and patties are just as likely to, to be take out for the pedestrian or the cyclist, within, especially in the downtown core, we have so much pedestrian activity, and that does not necessarily relate to a vehicle trip. I mean, it could be somebody comes down and shops at three three stores and decides to pick up something to take home for dinner. and, and an establishment that was focused on that, you know, I think can fit in that kind of environment. And there are other similar uses that operate in a similar nature. We'll kind of get into that. Um, so anyhow, that, that was just kind of the general uh, thought there. So a, a possible approach, and this is really kind of putting aside the under other vendor uh, question, um, but a possible approach could be to, to create a definition of the mobile food vending. Uh, within the zoning code that is in, in consistent with the city's existing vendor ordinance that ad addresses the public right away. So the vendor ordinance would address the public right away and the zoning code would address the private and then it'd be consistent as far as the allowable uses. Um, so that would recognize the activity in the zoning code and provide a greater alignment between those two sections. Um, the definition could certainly address the, temp the temporary and transitory nature of vending activities. Um, and create the distinction between what's a eating establishment and what's a vending activity. Um, and I guess, again, kind of mentioned as part of that, we'll just need to think through whether we want, wish to, or do not wish to address other type of vending uh, activities. Uh, the, that, act, that defined use could then be 
addressed as either a permitted principal or accessory use. Um, and I just listed the majority of the commercial districts that that, that could occur within. Certainly that may, it could include other districts. Um, there is some communities that we've looked at um, only allow them as an accessory use of so where you have an existing developed site and a parking lot, for example. You know, they can happen within that, but they really didn't want them to congregate on vacant grass, dirt, or gravel lots. Um, so some have indicated that they can only occur on a property where there's an existing established principal use that has addressed such things as site access and parking and um, other site considerations and did not <coughs> uh, allow them as a principal use on a vacant lot. And I don't know that that's necessarily the direction that we would need to go. Um, but there's a, certainly a consideration about whether it should be a principal use in and of itself or an accessory use or you know, a temporary use, which we don't necessarily address currently in the zoning code. So the urban ag created greenhouses and things as accessory uses where there was no principal yeah. use. Right. Is that a, a third way to split <laughs> split a hair there? Right. It be, be, could be very addressed in a similar fashion okay. as, as a intermediate um, use. How was, um, I think her name was Don who had the, the Airstream trailer coffee place and mm -hmm. it, how was that tr classified? That was permanently affixed on a foundation. In that oh, location. it was. So, oh, okay. so it, was, it was viewed as a structure. Oh, okay. It was not viewed as a vehicle. So because it was in a permanent location gotcha. connected to water and sewer utilities okay. and power, it was viewed as, as a structure. Oh. Well, we, I don't know if it predated you, but we used to have a mobile coffee cart right on Main Street. Do you remember that? On it was before we had any coffee shops. The old cart in front of Yeah, it was in front Michael of Michael Bus. Bus. What was in yes. front of Michael Bus? What, what would that be? You now, a cart like that in the right of way would be vending that I think generally is, is I mean, that's food and drink service. But it, but it would um, still be mobile. It would still be mobile. It wouldn't, wouldn't be establishment. And that's, yeah. that's the distinction. The question I asked of, of Rod is, do we have an inherent conflict? Because the vending ordinance talks about it. It only allows vending activities that are permissible underneath the zoning code. And so we discussed the fact that we have this on-premise versus off-premise distinction in the CV district, yet we're permitting vending activities in the right-of-way in the CV district. And he felt that the distinction is these are not establishments because they are not, right. not they don't sense. have a permanence. Yeah. And therefore, he didn't feel that there was a conflict. It was a vending activity that was specifically being authorized underneath the vending ordinance and therefore that allowed that activity to occur on the public property. But that he did see that it's not clearly allowed on private property within the same zoning district. But yes, I remember Michael Bus card. That was okay. Okay, so they must have been getting their power from Michael Bus. Maybe was it I would assume. I would assume so. And then, it yeah. had to come from somewhere. Yeah. 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 So okay. So there was adjunct sort of. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, if it was limited to a permitted accessory use, it's anticipated that site elements such as site access, parking, and public improvements may have already been addressed and satisfied with the principal use. Um, and we do, within the city zoning code, the trigger or requirements for public improvements are typically tied to the issuance of a building permit for a principal structure. And with this type of activity, um, you know, it's not a structure, it's a vehicle. And so those standards or requirements would not be triggered by somebody establishing that kind of use on, on a property. So. Just a few things to, to consider as far as the nature or classification of the use of how, how we'd like to, to suggest that or whether we wish to try to int introduce temporary uses as a new section within the zoning code to address these that are maybe neither, they're neither principal nor are they really accessory, they are temporary or transitory in nature. Um, the other aspect is, is if they're defined and named in the code, then there could be some um, fairly minimal standards that could be um, placed just to ensure that they are separated from fire hydrants or sidewalks and driveways so they're not obstructing those areas. Um, you could place limitation upon the construction of any permanent structures associated with the activity um, on the property. The duration on site, uh, one example was you know, 12 hours in any 24 hour period that requires you know, them to 
to not become a permanent fixture upon the property, but to but have to, a, a good serviceable window. Um, you know, you could go from noon to midnight, or, or or and they can move around obviously instead of a new location. But it that that would tend to place maybe some sideboards on how long something sits on a property and how um, it maybe manages its permanence. Uh, certainly, you know, you could put some clearance from the sidewalk just to make sure that um, lines of customers aren't obstructing the, you know, just to get some, um, avoid obstructions and congestion you know, on the public walk at least a little bit. Many communities require them to be set back five feet off the walk just to, to try to avoid that. Um, require that there be a trash receptacle on site just so that that's maintained. Um, obviously, you know, prohibit any dumping of waste material, gray water, or other stuff, um, unless in improved location. And then possibly uh, restroom facilities have come up in our research, whether it is uh, consideration of, of customers or employees is another. And oftentimes, obviously, the, 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 you know, the vehicles are not going to have a restroom facility. And so the common accommodation is that they can make uh, an agreement with a nearby business for the employee to be able to utilize their restroom facilities. And customer uh, facilities generally aren't going to kick in unless you had a fairly extensive uh, you know, seating area. So it's not something that's generally addressed for, for something. And some communities prohibit outdoor seating specifically for that reason. I don't think that they're, you know, we're likely to see anything to the degree that requires us to address that. Um, it, you know, you could have a situation where you have four or five, you know, Portland has several lots where they end up with four, five, six, seven of them on a site like that. And when you got a concentration like that, maybe a porta potty is something that should be considered, but I just don't necessarily see that in our near future. So I'm not you know, too concerned about that. But there are some, some maybe fairly basic um, elements that, that maybe more relate to the avoiding the, the permanence of a structure on a site and um, just some kind of basic trash receptacles and not blocking the sidewalk or not obstructing fire hydrants, just some kind of basic standards. Um, What's the status of the discussion about a public restroom downtown someplace? There is a steering committee that's meeting next week to start the conversation, and I think the goal is to bring a recommendation to the council within about three months' time. Um, so I think that would be that will be explored in some detail here very soon. Um, I still think it would be good to to address <coughs> the CBGB on-premise, off-premise takeout uh, discussion. Um, I don't know that I see a significant distinction between the on-premise and off-premise or that it's maybe necessary the downtown core. And as I mentioned, I think there are a number of retail destinations or bagel shops or coffee shops or movie rental establishments that have the same customer in and out kind of activity. Um, but many people combine trips when they're in the downtown area. And so I, I think those activities would have a fairly similar visit duration or vehicle trips generated from that activity and, and so I guess I don't necessarily see a significant compelling reason that we we continue with that distinction um, and that would help eliminate some in inconsistency if we were to say that mobile food vending is allowed on a private property um, as allowed by right yet somebody who wants to put up a permanent structure would have to have a condition use permit for that activity. You know, there would be a disparity between the fact that somebody happens to be in a vehicle and somebody happens to be in a, a permanent structure that one would have a different use uh, classification. So that would help address that situation as well, um, should that occur. So, uh, But this would be a walk-up window, not a drive-up. Correct. Drive-throughs are a different named use in zone code. Okay. And those have a more significant impact in the central business district for pedestrian conflicts and um, but it is not across the sidewalk. Yeah. But I think the takeouts, just takeouts themselves, whether it's a pizza pipeline as it used to be down on Main or um, Patty's when they first started, don't present the same level of conflict because they're serving pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists and, and others, and it doesn't. The drive-through means it's a vehicle going through the right. The takeout window does not necessitate that. And, and in the downtown area, we have a lot of other modes of mobility in that area. So I guess I'm um, looking for a direction from, from the commission. Um, if you wanted us to pursue uh, 
developing a, a draft to consider, we could certainly uh, work on that. I think in this case, it would probably be beneficial for us to work with the downtown um, business community and, <coughs> and the chamber and also existing mobile food operators, much like we did on the urban ag discussion, just to make sure that, that um, I guess they understand that we're supportive of the activity. We're not trying to, right. not trying to, we actually, actually want to get it above board and clearly permissible, promote it, some very general uh, standards. I mean, you can run into conflicts in areas between bricks and mortar and trucks. Um, there are many communities that require separation 200 feet, 300 feet from an entrance to a restaurant because of that, that competition conflict. I don't know that we necessarily would have that here, but it would be good to, to understand that. Um, and hear from the business, downtown business community and see what they think. Um, so if, if that was the case, we could certainly put together uh, in July, put together a, at least a rough outline, maybe not even in ordinance form, but kind of like we did with the Urban Act, just kind of a rough outline. We could work with the chamber to get that distributed in the downtown, especially the restaurant community, <coughs> and reach out to the those who may be operating the grub truck and other other types you know, of these activities and uh, solicit their input and then we could kind of decide where we would like to go from there. I, I wonder if, I don't know how to do it. I'm trying to think, how would you reach potential entrepreneurs? Yeah, tough. Who, who, who would, oh yeah, that that would be a roadblock. <laughs> with the, with the farm community, there were enough of them that we could, were established that we could reach Grub truck might be the only. Might be the best one. Right. You know, right. might might be the best one we have. That's actually, I mean, those or maybe the um, um, in the east side. The uh, what's the name escaping me? The Mexican restaurant in the east side. Oh, oh La Madrid. Didn't La Madrid start? Yes, in, they, they started they out. Started out in over there before they opened here, and then they moved from. What is now the um, um, antique. Antique, antique shop yeah. mm -hmm. out to the mall? They started in a, a mobile yes. food truck as well. They did, my yeah. And it parked part a lot side. down yeah. there by the silos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they did enough business that uh, moving to a brick and mortar. Yeah. And then moving to a better brick and mortar. So that's the progression we'd like to. Right. Yeah. There's two happy stories, right? Yeah. Patty's is one of those happy stories. That's another one. Yeah. Well, we like Mexican food around here. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Um, so I, I have two spots where I would like to imagine this would work. One is um, at Moscow Building Supply. From 11 to 2, Monday to Friday, I would think there are a lot of folks who are in the building trades who would say, you know, I could combine the trip I need to make <laughs> with a trip to get lunch, and, and it could. So I'm just imagining it could work, and wonder why nobody's doing it. So the issue there would, would you be. Would you want to drive through though? <laughs> um, well. But now we'd be into a whole other yeah. situation, yeah. and and, yeah. and nobody seems to want to build a brick and mortar drive-through right, right. there. You know. Right. But that lot that sits on the corner has been vacant a long time, mm -hmm. and that lot could be accessed by a pedestrian from the Moscow Building Supply parking lot, gravel, sales, whatever. I mean, there'd be a way to to get over there fairly sure. easily. Um, so I've wondered why that hasn't happened. And the other one. And where my interest in this first started was a conversation that I had with Jeff Jones about the Six and Jackson, um, the URA property on the diagonal opposite from where we've seen um, Vlad's uh, on the Royal Motor Inn corner, on the other corner. And there, it would seem again, it was a way for the crossing district to try to generate some preliminary activity under the heading of, you know, it's cheap, it's quick, it's lightweight, 
you can move on when somebody's ready to actually buy that property and build on it. Mm -hmm. um, and there, that it might be, you could hope for two kinds of things. Uh, two trucks. I don't think we'd ever see more than two trucks in Moscow. But, um, And on that side, I wonder whether, sometimes when I've experienced these trucks, they're kind of high. For the per for the for the customer, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything you're doing is up here. What would ha which is a struggle with your permanence issues? Mm -hmm. What would happen if it was possible to have a platform that the truck could pull along, like a train station platform, right? Mm -hmm. The truck could pull along, and the customer could come up one or two steps and be able to be more at eye level with what was going on in the truck. But then that raises the, but the, you know, and then the URA was doing that, then they put a trash receptacle there, and various features that would make the whole thing a little bit more um, amenable. The platform might be a problem in terms of obstructing sidewalks. Well, you would certainly want it to not obstruct uh, further down is uh, University Point building where you, essentially they, for flood reasons, have mm -hmm. an elevated platform a, alongside the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't want to. And they have to. an accessibility. They have a way up to get up onto yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Or you look at how Fish Folks sort of sets up in the co op lot mm -hmm. where you know everything's in the truck, but then he comes down to table level. Yeah, to interact mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the people, right. So that's another one of the list of ongoing food vendings. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So are you talking about that kind of structure built by who would? Well, since this is happening on private property, mm -hmm. I would assume that the property owner right. mm -hmm. was a is going to charge some rent or something to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. to authorize this thing to be there, mm -hmm. and B decides I'm going to do these things to make it more amenable to this happening. It seems that you could um, address a lot of the peripheral issues with the the suggestion of not being allowed to be in one place for more than a set amount of time. You can only set up so much and take up so much space and set up so many things if you can only be there for, you know, say three hours at a time mm -hmm. or no more than 12 hours in a 24 hour period or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got a, a self. There, there's also built into that that uh, it's going to get cleaned up, and the area is going to get policed and taken care of every time they pack up and do that. Um, so that might be a way to address some of the. The other concerns. I like the idea. Of, so you're suggest you're proposing that at this point, uh, working with Chamber of Commerce to do some sort of survey of the downtown businesses and see what they think of that. Yeah. I think that I would be to avoid stepping into any potential unforeseen. Conflict. I mean, it's yeah. happening in the, in the right way. So, I, I mean, I actually don't see the downtown as being an issue because it's been happening in the right way. It's mm -hmm. permissible in the right way. You actually, if you're vending in front of a business, you have to get their permission. Um, so that's the way the, the right of way vending is occurring. You could have a vacant property next to an established restaurant that, if it was happening on the private property, that you know, per, it could be in close proximity and permission would not be. Required, and so you you can you could have situations where um, I think you have to even if you're even directly adjacent to food service, you have to get some form of permission from that owner to be in front of them. So there are some some limited protections right now for activities happening right away in front of an establishment, and so that would all exist. Um, but there. If you look at some other ordinances, even if they're on a private property that has a restaurant, it has to be on that site, 200 feet away from that entry, even if they have permission to be on that site. And I don't, you know, I don't see that we would have an issue. But it'd be good to ask the question, just to make sure that you know that these are the folks that are in in the business that know, you know, how it, how it works for them and what, where the potential pitfalls are. And I think it would just be 
wise to reach out and, and uh, seek that input and then we can move from there. Would the survey also include uh, potential customers to see what the demand is for the for that? Yeah, I I, I think the it wouldn't be. I don't know if it would necessarily be our intent. I don't, I don't know how we would conduct something broad enough to, to reach that. Um, but I think the the you know that would be the individual entrepreneur would have to have to establish that mm -hmm. to understand what the market is to, when they make that investment. Um, but I do, I do would like to hear from those that have gone through that transition that would like to, you know, would like to see that path to go from uh, those currently engaged in it uh, and better understand their perspective as well as the existing restaurants in the downtown and other locations. So regarding the question of principal use or an auxiliary use, I kind of like the thought of what we did in the ag order. That is, making it pretty low threshold. Yeah. And that, so again, the two sites that I've pointed you to, there may or may not be a curb cut. That's the truck's problem, not our problem. If the terrain is so lousy that a person can't walk up to the truck, that's not our problem. I mean, that's. The owner of the land who decided, yes, I'm going to have this mobile vending thing here, if they thought it was adequate to have rutted mud, <laughs> and, the, and the truck likes it, then... <laughs> More power to them. <laughs> well, why should we get in the way and complicate that by building a set of standards around that? The, there, there can be some limited... We do have some concerns regarding Red and mud and tracking in the right of way and that thing. So, so we, we can establish some very basic, you know, all weather surface, gravel, minimal access, not not like a, a full public improvement or, or standard requirement. And I think especially if you have that duration limitation, then it's it's a transitory use and it may be here this month and it may be gone next. And mm -hmm. you know, there's really not anything I think that warrants the level of kind of full improvement like you would see with the establishment of a, a permanent structure on the property that has a 50-year lifespan. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And so I think if, if we even list it as a, as a principal use and maybe as part of some of those minimal standards is just a kind of an all-weather surfacing or if it's in an area that requires off-street parking, you know, that there be one stall, you know, or, you know, some basic and it doesn't have to be fully improved, but just some so very and the you know access obviously if they're going to establish a new curb cut then has to be permitted by public works department to look at the public safety aspects of that approach. But that's most of these are going to probably be dealing on existing sites with existing access, and I don't think that's necessarily an issue. And it, um, some basic all weather surfacing requirement, which is you know generally gravel. Over right, hundred dollars <laughs> worth of gravel <laughs> it can it can help eliminate tracking out onto the street or you know um, which sediment and erosion uh, transport. So there are probably some limited things that we could look at that would be mm -hmm. better calibrated to the use and the nature and the, the duration of limitation of hours would help mitigate um, the need for you know, permanent public improvements. And I heard Gregory endorsing some 12 and 24 or other kind of idea. That, that makes some sense to me. I just want to and I think that we could help shape once we hear the input about what works. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think right now, grab trucks and Howard Hughes Wednesdays during the noon hour for two, three hours, and then Thursdays at Archer's, and then downtown, I think, on the Friday and Saturday nights, and usually it's more late night uh, crowds. So I don't think they're staying in any one location for more than 12 hours. But we can, we can certainly find out you know, what, what would be an appropriate time, what, you know, what would be... We don't want to move every two hours so you can't make any money because you're breaking, you know, setting up and tearing down constantly. Um, I just don't want them to become encampments or permanents. And <laughs> <laughs> Joel, did you have a comment? No, oh, I was just going to endorse the proposal I see on the screen up there. I, I guess I'd like to see staff uh, uh, prepare a draft and contact um, Chamber of Commerce and possible uh, truck owners and so on.
Right now, uh, I don't know if anybody here has been down to Lewiston recently, but uh, in the area where they have uh, uh, Dairy Queen and three or four of the other restaurants, uh, I think it's almost right next to or within shouting distance of the old train station. Mm -hmm. There is uh, a uh, uh, taco stand, for back of, uh, lack of a better word, that has been there every time I've been down to Lewiston. And that seems to be working well with them. I have no idea what the rules are, but it's in a vacant lot and you can get in and out of it um, from two different directions. And there is, um, as up at Moscow Building Supply, plenty of room to pull in something, get out, go get, eat there or drive away. And uh, they seem to have figured out how to make it work down Lewiston. And, So probably some way less than ordinance level thing, we'll look at it and, and start the process to reach out to. That's good. Mm -hmm. Respective audiences. Mm -hmm. Great. Sounds good. Uh, next item is the, our shared readings discussion. <coughs> our discussion of shared readings. <coughs> Them all. Yes. No. Yeah, I did. So you're talking about the June ones for millennial generation. Yes. Because yeah, there's millennial. a couple of other ones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, but they're kind of grouped by month. I think. Right. The last, okay. the most recent ones are. I wasn't sure if we were trying to play catch up from times we didn't get to them, or if we were just going with the month. Just keep moving so I, I took the the right approach of uh, going with June. I, I didn't have as much time, unfortunately, to go through these as I as I would have liked because I always enjoy the the readings and thank you for for uh, heading this up. But um, one question I had as I went through is is what is I don't know what I don't have, really have a sense of what's going on in Moscow as far as the demand goes. Um, I'm a little bit skewed probably because we're a college town, but does anybody have any feel for that? What the, what the trend is as opposed to home ownership versus rental among the permanent population? It's hard to isolate what is a trend of the Great Recession in economic pressures and what is a trend from personal choice and preference. I mean, I think we're seeing many people purchasing, I think the, the, the largest area we've seen is in the twin homes. Um, so, single family construction is down considerably over the last five years. You know, historically we would permit somewhere around 45 units per year, and we have been permitting about 20 to mid 20s. Last year it was 30. Um, this year it's eight so far. So the single family starts are down dramatically. Um, but over the same last 10 years, employment's down one and a half percent in Lake County, and we've lost. You know, a couple hundred jobs, and so you know you can correlate some of that obviously because people need employment and income to be able to buy a home, and so that's driven down um, some of the single-family activity. We have seen a fairly significant um, increase in twin homes, so attached to single-family dwellings, and so we've ever since we passed that ordinance, um, we have seen a large number of those constructed. And in those are you know more compact single-family units, not completely detached, have a common wall. Um, but we have seen a strong market response to those, and, and, and Larry Leppelman, who has been building most of those, can again pretty much sell them about as quickly as he can he can build them. So, um, so those are going into uh, private ownership rather yes. than rental. Yes. So are these ones that are part of a sort of Planned community development. Like no, these um, are these are just the green one. You know what I'm talking about near the traffic rotary. That there's 
So you have the common areas, I guess. That's yeah. Right. So yeah. so these are speaking of just are in predominantly recently Indian Hill Six edition. Okay. So on Alturas Drive behind the old okay. Tidemans. Um, there's been a large number of twin homes that have been constructed there, as well as a couple of four-unit uh, townhouse buildings. And so we have seen a lot of activity happening in that market. And if you go out on White Avenue out east, where we had more of the planned unit developments, um, so you had Temple Commons, um, those were all independent, detached, but only you know, three and a half feet, you know, the lot line's three and a half feet out from the building uh, wall. There were twin homes in Green Acres that was That's on Bristol, yeah. um, and those all sold fairly quickly uh, when that project started. I think there's two units left that to be yet to be <coughs> constructed, but those are detached individual units around the, the center common green. Um, but that project has really, um, really did sell pretty well, and they were a little bit ahead of some of the other projects in terms of when the recession kicked in. Um, still got caught kind of in the middle of it, but then they also had um, some of the um, financing package allowed for some of the for those in certain income levels to have a, a buy down of the purchase price to reduce some of the, of the the cost of the units. I think that helped their sales in that project. Um, the tempo really is kind of stalled out, and I don't think I think we permitted two units in there in the last. 24, 18 months, and it's about half um, constructed. And those are detached units, but on fairly small footprints, small lots. Um, Camden also tended to kind of stall out. So Camden, of course, right actually right across the street from Tempo. Um, two are actually under construction there now. That'll leave four lots left. It has a 12 unit project. And so that one is actually starting to pick up a little bit of momentum. Um, but certainly, I think there were a number of folks that maybe transitioned into multifamily just due to the economic conditions that were happening and some of the employment loss and for lows and other activities that were happening at U of I. So it's, it's kind of hard to differentiate, you know, what we're seeing in the market from what's happening in the economy as a whole. Um, I think it's clear that you can see from some of the readings that there are certain preferences that people are, are looking for and proximity and being close, you know, walkable distance. Um, I think is, is, is always, or at least over the last six, seven years, has been a consistently articulated desire. Um, <coughs> and you know, some of the readings, I kind of gave, I kind of put a mix in there because some were, you know, suggesting that millennials are, are, this is what they're wanting, and some of the articles were cautioning against making assumptions on them at such an early age that, right. you know, people are putting off marriage and children to later points in, in their life and and it just may be that they haven't reached that stage yet um, and so it's it is something that you, you hear a lot about is that well there's a different trend they all want to live downtown and be able to bike to the and that may be great for their where they are in their life right now but there may be a day where the picket fences are calling and you know single family is is an interest uh, multifamily has nationally been outpacing single family threefold in new housing starts ever since the recession began. And that, obviously, that had to do with foreclosures and um, you know, people underwater walking away from homes, not being able to purchase again due to credit reasons, moving into to, you know, multifamily units in the meantime. Um, and um, so that, that's. So there's that, rental properties or homeowners? I mean, is, do you know what the statistics the portion is? As I mean, are, multifamily are rentals. Rentals or, or yeah, I think majority of yeah. rentals. And yeah. the the strongest market in this recession has been student family, student student housing, um, and so that's why you've seen s these large real invest real estate investment groups, you know, building the growth projects and these large multifamily because you know traditionally in a recession, although we necessarily did not necessarily experience it here. It's a time of high enrollment as people go back to the additional skills and training education. And so student housing is, is a strong market. And, and that was really student housing. Multifamily has been the residential market in the last five years, and student housing being the premier. Mm -hmm. um, and they've perfected the models where, you know, the buy the bedroom rent, um, where you can command four to 500 per bedroom on a three-bedroom unit, you can 
you, you know, with pretty good money. <laughs> you, can, you can command a pretty good rent, and they understand the the uh, roommate situation and and how individual residents don't want to be entangled in a lease with somebody else, and somebody can leave them hanging. And so, having that independence of an independent lease on a bedroom that they can walk away from, that you know, whatever they're done with it, and not be dependent wow. on somebody else, I think. And furnishing a lot of the amenities, the, the utilities and internet and TV and you know, kind of that element, um, that has been a very lucrative market. And so I think you've seen a lot of investment in that. I mean, in, in the since 2008. So, is is there? Um, you got some clearly got some knowledge about the trends. Is there be prior to the recession or when economies are doing better? Is there more demand on the single family as opposed to the yeah. multifamily? Yeah. I mean, like a clear, noticeable yeah, switch in the. Single family was on a, uh, on a tear up mm -hmm. until the brink of the recession. And then, um, you know, just the deflation in markets, people being underwater, and then now just the, the you know, one of the articles addressed the criteria to mm -hmm. get a loan. And but among um, single family, it's interesting, at least in the the architectural literature that I read um, and get um, that um, the millennials really want a smaller are gravitating towards a much smaller footprint size partly because they don't want to go in debt like their parents did and lose their homes partly energy conservation and consciousness more compact development so you know a lot of that is showing <coughs> up in um, you know, architecture magazines yeah. This is when they have three kids. Do they still want that? Mm -hmm. yes. Does that fit <laughs> their lifestyle? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if they live in Seattle, they probably have to. They have no choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm keenly interested in this set of readings because, from the standpoint of the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust, are there really buyers that we're imagining for affordable single-family homes? Um, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the twin homes. So I did some back of the envelope figuring looking at the income bracket that we intend to serve, which is 80% down to 50% of the area median income. So there's median. We're serving a bracket here. Up at that 80, a family of four at 80% can buy one of those twin homes at least at back of the envelope sort of thing. Uh, they're not packing a lot of other debt or something. Which was interesting to me in that it means that above that range that we serve, the commercial market may be solving the problem. But uh, my quest for this summer is to figure out how many buyers are really out there and what are their real interests in the range that we're serving. and. Some of those are going to be very young families, I think, mm -hmm. couples. And are they looking for an inexpensive twin home, or are they looking for something that some of we have imagined at times appearing in Legacy Crossing or somewhere much more urban feeling? Uh, and I just don't know, but it, it, I think it would be really important to our strategy as an organization to figure out who those buyers are. Mm -hmm. How is that even, it, I'm, I'm clueless in, as to how builders determine these kind of things. How do they, how do they decide what the market is, what the, what the demand is for certain kinds of housing like that? That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, Talk, to the the <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the realtor. Talk to the realtor. Look at the comparable sales. See what price points are moving. Um, it, 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 you can look at the sales, average listing, you know, prices and sales. and and just look at what product is moving in the market. And they tend to target that. I mean, obviously, before 2007, they were much more willing to take a risk at specking a home. And in 2007 and 8, we we're permitting like 72 units a year. Um, so 70 plus houses in Moscow was a large production. It was you know, nearly 50% above traditional averages. And at that point in time, you know, they were specking two, maybe three homes at a shot. Um, now it's one. Uh, or it's a pre-sold, you know, custom. Uh, it's it's you know the the, the lending institutions have have been much more restrictive about how much they're willing to put out there, and 
obviously the builders are still concerned about the condition of the market right now. And so obviously they're not very interested in taking risk. And so I think most of the specs that we've seen right now are down in the you know, low to mid price point that are in the, the you know, maybe the 170 for the twin home up to the 230 for a detached single family. Um, there aren't too many there that are specking into the 300 range at the moment. Um, we had one builder that did one here about two years ago. It was a, it was a, it was 18 months ago. It was a very nice lot in an existing developed neighborhood, and so there were some things going for it. And he actually did, did pretty well and was able to didn't have to sit on it very long. Um, so that was that was a good thing. But there aren't too many people that pushing into the. 350, 400 on a spec home in this market right well, now. Well, it's a rarefied air in Moscow. There aren't many <coughs> jobs that are supporting. The universities yeah. aren't increasing faculty and staff who can afford over yeah. 300. I mean, it, we're, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, a rarefied air over 300. Yeah. And it's, so. you know, the the economies across the state line are dramatically different than what's happening here. Yep. Um, it, it is a, and I had to give a little uh, talk today on the state of the commercial market, and you know, from 03 to 13, Whitman County um, has gained 14% in employment, added about 2,100 jobs in the same time that we lost 200 here. Um, to U of I, from 2004 to 14 or 13, in the last 10 years, has lost 563 students, and WSU has added 1,900. Um, <laughs> and uh -huh. so, you realize that marijuana is legal in Washington. People are happy. And obviously, manufacturing in Schweitzer, they have 1,460 right. jobs in the right. last 10 years in manufacturing, mm -hmm. like manufacturing in Whitman County. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a thousand of them is pretty much Schweitzer. And so there's a lot of, a lot of economic activity happening there. And it's, uh, we look at some. Um, economic index indices that look at three criteria income in a variety of forms, uh, trailing industries, so that's retail and construction and sole proprietorships, small business startups, construction activity, and retail sales. They follow money. You know, When there's money in the market, small businesses pop up, coffee shops, restaurants, and, and then transfer payments, which is a negative indicator in the market. And uh, in the last since 2004 to 14, there's 577 micropolitan statistical areas in the nation. We were ranked at 127, which is a good high number, and Pullman was 514 in 2004. Was, was what? 514. Oh, really? <clears throat> wow. wow. We have flipped. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. We met in the middle in 2008, and we both were going on yeah. the right trajectory, and about three years ago, we did this, and they did yeah. that, yeah. and it's uh, now almost reverse trend. But, there, but it's, it's now tipping up. So we've, we actually gained 40 slots just last year. And that tends to lag. That indicator is based on the year's prior data uh, published early 14. I expect to see us hitting an, another bump next year. And employment is projected to grow by 5.4% over the next five years. Um, and so there, there, are, there are some good trends. But it has not been an easy decade um, with the recession and U of I going through a lot of the state support reductions and the furloughs and and um, that's just a has a significant impact on the community so I mean dad on uh, what percentage of the um, uh, people employed in the new jobs in Whitman County reside in Idaho and reside in you Moscow? can say roughly between 20 and 30 percent I think with Schweitzer it's about 25 percent in Moscow specifically about 32 I think in, in Latok County as a whole that work in Pullman that are employed here. Uh, we've always said generally a third of WSU's staff and faculty have resided here. I don't, I haven't heard a recent number, but that's still true. And, and people pay the penalty. The, the income state tax income tax to live here? Yeah. To live here. And, yeah. you know, so that says a lot about the community, a lot of good things. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, there are, you know, a lot of good things. You know, unemployment in the last four years has gone from 7.2% Lake Tuck County to 43 this month. Um, the workforce has increased um, by about 500 um, in the last four years, and per capita, per capita income has grown 16% in the last three years. 
in Lytow County, and for the first time in about 12 years, we are higher than the state in per capita income. Mm -hmm. We have trailed the state of Idaho um, ever since, well, my chart was going back to 2002, and we actually this year surpassed them in per capita income. That's, that's a dynamic happening in the state, that the state lost 50, 56,000 jobs in the recession, and a lot of the jobs that have come back are low earning um, positions, and that's kind of thing kind of helped bump us over. What is the figure per capita income, roughly? Uh, get you the exact number. Um, thirty-four thousand six hundred and seven. That's in mm -hmm. Moscow. It's in Moscow. In two thousand nine, we were twenty-nine thousand eight hundred and forty. So in that three-year time period, we've uh, gained sixteen percent. Uh, nationally, it's forty-three thousand seven hundred thirty-five. And what was the Idaho, the state? So we're higher than. I don't actually have Idaho's number. It's about. It looks like it's thirty-three thousand and change. Oh, okay. I actually just put the national and the and the uh, local number up there, oh. mm -hmm. but it's uh, anyhow it, it's you know it, this month we just the na the nation recovered to the 2008 employment levels so that's mm -hmm. a that's a, I think a, a good slog. symbolic milestone two years to lose them four years to add them back and then but then you have to account for the loss of growth that occurred during that time period and we were just back to where we were in 2008 um, so that's a that, that's a Significant, uh, but it's it's I think it's a good, it's a significant um, milestone mm -hmm. to hit that number. Mm -hmm. Eight point seven million jobs lost in that time period is a lot to hit. Yeah. Huh. All right, thank you. Um, we have another item to put on the agenda here, um, which is to talk about our calendar of meetings for the next part of the summer. Um, the intention is to cancel the next meeting, the, so which will be the last meeting in June, three weeks from now, and to cancel the first meeting in July. I can't remember, is that about the 9th? Yes. The 9th. Mm -hmm. So that we would skip from now until the second meeting in July. Which is? 23rd? Which July 23rd. Mm-hmm. Okay. Should be 23rd. Just to give time for. Well, because Bill is going in one piece of the time, and I'm going in another piece of the time, and I think Wendy's out in another piece of the time, and it just sounds good. It's not not <laughs> not, not a crushing amount of business, and yeah. so it seemed like we could just afford to. Not 40 new housing starts. That no, you no. <laughs> <laughs> no urgent rezones, yeah. um, and so maybe we can back and forth between us over the course of the next essentially six weeks, find some more readings and, and so that maybe we can manage to pull it together and have something at our next, another discussion at our next meeting. Because well, we don't have, we don't know that we have a lot coming at that next meeting either, do we? No, we'll, we'll have an outline for the mobile food then just to have you take a look at. Okay. Um, we may have yeah, I'll have to take a look and see what else we have. So we'll we can certainly pull together some. Okay. So the invitation is you've identified. Looks like maybe you're pulling well, out Well, it needs to be is. scanned because I only yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you want to leave with us, we can scan it. <coughs> and it right. probably only part of it would be. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? We're adjourned. Okay. Thank you.